Hello. Welcome. And welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are restarting the blog with um, our next wonderful presenter, Alice, who is uh, also um, director at Cherry Leaf. And uh, you might know him from the Cherry Leaf podcast. And uh, on a side note, um, I really like listening to Alice's voice. And you put a lot of effort into educating people. So thank you very much. And I believe this presentation is going to be continuing that stream. Thank, thank you, that's very kind of you. Um, so I timed this at 18 minutes, so I need to uh, get a wiggle on. So um, okay. we're going to cover, um, if I can get the slides to move forward. Oops, I need to have my other window open for that. Uh, this is what we're going to cover. We're going to cover four things. I'll bring this up there. Um, a problem that we wanted to solve, some proof of concepts to solve the problem, some challenges and limitations in the solutions we built, and ways in which the solutions could be improved. So we're going to be down in the weeds with this. Um, just a little bit about me, which is relevant to why we've done things in certain ways. I'm a director at Cherry Leaf. We're a technical writing services company in the UK. And the other thing we do is training courses. So about the problem, this came up on the Write the Docs forum earlier in the year, and somebody posted this. We have a large and complex product with multiple releases a week. Is there any sort of AI tool or automation that could look at the JIRA commits, compare this to our Help Center documentation, and flag it to me, any resources that need updating? And this sounded a really interesting question. And an answer sprung to mind, and we decided to look at whether that would work or not. And that was whether this could be done with what's called GPTS. Well, I'm not clear if it's GPTS or GPTs, but we use the word, we call it GPTS. So what are they? They are a customized version of Chat GPT. So you can adapt Chat GPT for a specific purpose. And you can do this if you pay for ChatGPT. So if you're a user of ChatGPT Plus or ChatGPT Enterprise, then GPTSs are available for you to create. So if you want to create a GPTS, you go in to uh, create and hit the configure button and a whole manner of different boxes appear. And I'll just explain those to you. There's an area where you put your prompt. So that's the same as entering a prompt into Claude or ChatGPT. There's an area where you can create buttons which are canned prompts. So other users, if they don't know what to ask, that you can have those ready for them. You have an area where you can upload a, a document such as a knowledge file. And you have also an area where you can make requests to gather external information via another third party's API. So the other thing we knew, as well as that there were these things called GPTSs, was that tools like Jira, GitLab, and GitHub all have their own APIs. And with a bit of digging around the documentation, what we found was that one of the endpoints that was available in those tools was one that listed or enabled you to retrieve the commits for a repository. So what we wanted to do was build a GPTS that could make an API request to GitLab or to uh, GitHub or Jira, depending on where the repository was, compare the commits that it retrieved from that API to the documentation, the Help Center documentation, and then recommend sections that needed updating. So those were three things we wanted this solution to do. So going back to that form, our request to the GitHub or GitLab or Jira API goes into the prompt. The prompt to request to make recommendations also goes into the prompt. Our help center documentation goes into the knowledge file area. And the schema for GitLab, GitHub, or Jira goes into the API schema section at the bottom in the light blue. So what we did was we built proofs of concept because we run training courses. This wasn't to solve a solution for 
code that we were developing and it wasn't a solution for a customer of ours, but more for something that we could build. So this is how you can do it and then others could then copy it. So we started off very, very simply with our first test by looking at, could we find an API that had no authentication, um, no API keys where, the, where we could just get information from it without any complications that might stop it from working. And so what we built was a simple guide, a tourist guide to London using the Meteo free weather API. So what we wanted was, if I click in the right place, it's our GPTS to make an API request for today's weather, compare it to our guide to traveling around London and the what to wear section, and recommend any updates based on what the weather was saying. So we filled in the different areas. It looks quite small on that, so let me make it bigger. We had some instructions saying what this GPTS does, that it uses data that it gathers to make recommendations to update a tourist guide. In the action information, we include the parameters that we want for the API call. So we're asking for the weather for London, and we want the weather for today. And then we've got a button we've created saying recommend updates. And our knowledge file was a markdown file, which was our tourist guide to London. So let me play the video and show you what happened. This is our tourist guide. Is that playing? Yes, it is. So we've got what to wear in the daytime, in the evening, things to see. And this is the API that we are using. And we can see when we did this recording, uh, it was 9.7 degrees, almost 10 degrees Celsius, about 55 in old money. And this is how our GPTS was configured with the different bits of information in the different sections. Our tourist guide to London was the file that we uploaded and a link to the API. And this is the chat GPT, the GPTS. There's our button. We can click on that. And it has a think, and it makes a call to the API, which is done. It then makes recommendations on what updates need to be made to the documentation. So we could prove that it worked in its very simplest terms. So let's make, I'll just let it run through for a little bit more. It also made recommendations on things to see based on the weather. And it says, wear, take a raincoat or an umbrella, which is always good advice for uh, London. Now, how can I go forward a slide? What goes forward a slide? Ah, oh, here we go. It's at uh, the bottom. So our second test, we looked at a product, an open source product on GitLab. Um, so that we, we could use it without breaking any copyright. And we came across a mailman. This is a server uh, application. It has an API in itself with API documentation in the guide, and it has a few commits on, a, on an occasional basis. So if you use GitLab, and the documentation was written in Read the Docs. Now, we don't, we're not involved with mailman, so what we had to do was we had to use a screen scraper to scrape the information from the user guide, and then we converted that into a single markdown file. If you're using GitLab and you're, um, you have repositories on that, then your API requests follow this format. For each repository um, and each fork of a repository, there's a project ID. And basically, you have to know that to gather the commits for a particular repository. So for this GPTS, um, what it does is that it makes a request to the relevant endpoint, which is called get repository commits. It also includes the project ID and um, it retrieves the commits. In this case, it retrieves all the commits and then it um, recommends updates. So here's the video of this working. And we've got a button here, recommend updates to the mailman documentation. It has a think, 
It makes requests to the GitLab API. And it recommends that the documentation updated to reflect the latest version, because that had been changed, an update to the privacy policy, and a reference to free node, change that um, to Libera, and to remove some outdated references. Okay, and so on. And our third test was with GitHub. Um, and one of the things when doing this was, well, how does it handle lots of um, commits during a day and a larger project? So Joplin is a equivalent of Evernote. And this documentation was written in Gitbook. So again, we have no involvement with Joplin. So what we did, excuse me, was again, scrape the, the documentation from their website convert it into a markdown file, and then upload it into our GPTS. If you're using GitHub, the way that you get make API requests for the repository commits is you have the owner and then the repo. So if you've done a fork, then you are the owner, and then it's the name of the repo. In this case, what we did was we asked uh, ChatGPT to create the GPTS, and it created the instructions. And what it did slightly differently was it um, asked to fetch commits, emphasizing those from the last day. Um, and it was a bit more, added more information into the instructions. And we, it also suggested three conversation starters. What's the latest commits? Show me yesterday's updates, suggest changes. And our knowledge file again, as I said, we created a markdown file with the user guide information. Joplin also has an API as well, which is in the which is documented in the in the knowledge file. Let's run that one. So our button asking what are the latest commits, it provides those. Now sometimes the GPTS does ask for permission to make that request to the API. That's why that button came up. And so on this particular day, I think there were five commits, if I remember correctly. Yep, five commits. So let's ask, let's see what it does when we ask it to suggest changes to the documentation. Again, it makes a request to the API to gather the information on the commits. And it suggests a number of changes, including improvements in the Enix file report, update a section on um, uh, nested tables, and dependency updates. Now, the final one said auto update of documentation, which made me wonder whether they were automatically updating the documentation anyway. That was just the um, release notes, the README file that they were generating. So let's move on. So those were our three proof of concepts. We didn't test it with Jira because we didn't have access to a Jira application in the open source to do that. But we could get it to work for GitLab, GitHub, and our own. So what were the challenges with this proof of concept? Well, one is we didn't have access to the authoring tools. Whereas if this were for yourself, you would have access to your own tool to generate a single file. And there were some challenges in um, when configuring the GPTS to get the API schema for GitLab and GitHub correct so that it would work. There are some um, issues that can arise from that. Some others, you have to pay for chat GPT for it to work. Microsoft has just also introduced its own equivalent of GPTS is called Copilot Pro. Again, that's a chargeable service. Um, you need to have the latest knowledge base file in the GPTS whenever you want the GPTS to update or recommend updates to the file. 
if you had lots of commits, potentially you might run out of context memory. And if you are using um, chat GPT, there's always, I guess, the potential risk of data security, uh, especially if you're making this GPTS publicly open to everyone. Not that I, I would think that you would do. And how could it be improved? Well, one is you could actually write an app, a Python app, that used GP, uh, OpenAI's API for GPT-4 instead of GPTS. And if you did that as part of your code, you could get it to retrieve the latest help file so you didn't have to upload it manually every time. Potentially, you could also use uh, one of the services from Zapier. They've introduced something called Zapier Central, which does something similar to GPTS, and that might be worth investigating. And another question that sometimes comes up is, well, could you ask ChatGPT, the GPTS, to do the next step and actually implement the changes for you rather than just make recommendations? And that might be another potential next step but you do have this context memory issue with ChatGPT, and there might be issues over the quality and consistency of the, of the content that it, it writes or rewrites. So I think there's still a role for the technical author, the technical writer to make those changes. And that is it. So our goal was to create a proof of concept for an e-learning course that we have, and the proof of concept worked. And if you have GPT, uh, GPT Plus or Enterprise or Copilot Pro, you can do this yourself. You can go particularly with Joplin and with Mailman. They're open source applications. Um, you can do it yourself with those. And that's the end. Thank you very much. While we are waiting for uh, any questions from the audience, I have two. One of them is um, while doing this proof of concept and afterwards, did your um, interest point or your hunch of uh, where this is going to be the most use change? And the other one is where do you see the front end of adoption right now? So one question is, uh, um, where, do, where does AI fit into the world of the technical writer? And our focus has been, can it be used to make technical writers more efficient and to create better output, rather than the question, will it replace technical writers? Mm -hmm. if, you look, if you look at people like Pinecone, which I know from personal experience, their documentation is created by human beings um, and other chatbots as well. And they're still, will be a need, as Christoph was saying, for human involvement in creating the content. So in terms of what can you use chat bots and, and AI to do, we can use it in our role to, as a tool to make our lives more efficient and better. The second question was about the frontline. Can you ask the question again? Um, the second question was because you are in contact with a lot of organizations and yeah. a lot of technical writers. And so you have a bit of a bird's eye view to seeing the pattern of not just like where is the top of the way, but where is the vanguard? Where do you see the edge right now in in uh, adopting um, LLMs and chat GPTs? I think people are still very much in the early days and mm -hmm. what they're primarily using it for is idea generation um, things around planning, doing mundane, uh, monotonous work. So if you've got a document and you need to convert it from one format to the next, if you've got a load of data that you need to extract and present in a table, um, or take four documents and combine them into one, they're using it for that type of, of content, that sort of monotony work behind the scenes just to speed things up, rather than anything particularly sexy and, and user-facing at this stage. Um, yeah. And do you know if those rather appealing and spectacular user-facing uh, solutions, are they already in the testing phase? Well, we've seen some stuff come and go where people have released things like chatbots and then, and then withdraw them um, for documentation, I think because they've not been happy with the quality so far. Um, so I've yet to – and that may – we may be not as widely um, out there as possible. I've yet to see some some great chatbots on documentation out in the field. I think Stripe had one and they withdrew it, um, if I remember correctly. 
Um, so I think it's still early days. Um, might mm -hmm. be crediting me with more knowledge and, or awareness than I have. Mm -hmm. I have one more rather controversial question. Um, so um, we saw in the presentation from Christian that like an accuracy from a chatbot, an accuracy of answers of statistically 98% yeah. is acceptable yeah. for you as a technical writer what what is that percentage that you would say okay this can go public mm, uh, i don't know um one issue with the rag approaches that everyone has talked about is hallucination and they tend to hallucinate um at the in the middle of the document and there are strategies if you're so the bigger the document you have, the more likely it is, even if you're using RAG, to hallucinate and provide wrong answers. And the um, one of the approaches to remedy that is you is there is uh, some tools by some companies which will pre-filter the answers from the RAG and then only look in those sections to provide the answer. And that is one way to mitigate the, the mistakes that are out there. But going back to your question about what's acceptable, um, I guess when it starts to have an impact on the support line where people have got the wrong answer from the documentation and they're going to the support line and saying, this isn't answering my question, what is the answer? And it's then having the impact on uh, extra calls to support. I guess that would be the impact, the point where it's not of an acceptable quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or it puts you at legal risk because you're, it's giving you incorrect answers. Yeah, yeah. From Satish, was it tested that how much data interface can accept, maybe in terms of number or words or lines? So we did test it. So the um, the tourist guide was just two pages. The um, Joplin one was about 258 pages. And the mailman one was, again, about 250 to 300 pages. So we tested it up to about that size. And I was talking... Um, uh, to, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now, uh, in from MasterCard um, in the break. And he was saying MasterCard's testing their documentation is about 250 pages as well. So I think around 250, 300 is a typical amount for a user guide. And it seems to work okay at, at that level. Um, but how big and at what point it breaks, I don't, uh, we didn't test it to destruction. Mm -hmm. Aside from chatbots, once they become published, do you see other um, features or capabilities that you see rather in the immediate future to become widespreadly used? Uh, probably grammar checkers, which are, you, you mean in terms of the use of yeah, AI? Right. Well, in terms of AI tools, that, um, uh, grammar and, and tone and style checkers, checking for consistency, uh, tools that help us um, identify content that's been written once and can be repurposed. There are tools, um, a few tools around there that do that and then are incorporating AI now to, to do that. Um, and uh, tools within uh, applications like Word for doing things like formatting and reformatting of information. I think um, as writers, we will um, be using those more and more. Mm -hmm. Probably the earliest adopters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, a, a Copilot for Word is available for free users and for enterprise users, but um, and for mobile users, but for some reason not SME users at the moment. Um, so there are people already using uh, AI within Word. Mm -hmm. Alice, thank you very much.